Nathan Schneider, it's great to have you on Team Human. You're one of the really original inspirations for this whole thing, believe it or not. Uh, it's an amazing it, show. I'm so glad oh, to be back on. Thank you for letting me. Oh, it's great. No, you're you're just, just, honestly just the original. Room. The original inspiration was you know I was doing like throwing rocks at the Google bus and talking about my own form of my, my own way of saying platform cooperativism and digital distributism and all that. And then me and Trevor, you know Schultz, who, who kind of co-founded that movement with you back then in the in in 2016, 2017 around then, you know me and Trevor had this very. Um, at the mo at the time anyway kind of an intellectual political understanding of it and then when you started speaking about it i could hear the echoes of and i mean this in the good way catholic social teaching and sort of grounded um grounded real world oh no this stuff actually matters to real people in real neighborhoods with actual factories and it's like oh right you know and it was it was really a turning point for me to that was when I started to teach to go oh I want to actually be in the community engaging with real people actually doing these things rather than um, simply thinking about them in that in that sci-fi way so so thanks for that and for continually reminding me and many of us that um, this stuff matters insofar as it comes from people in the real world yeah well you're you know the the what you represented for me was huge just a kind of invitation and and um an affirmation about recognizing that the things we were doing trying to build something new in this platform cooperativism stuff was also old and is also something like very deep and that we do not have to evade history in order to um build justice that there are roots that we can draw from and that you know that that you know those of us with uh you know we there's so much more yeah there's so much more than the kind of now and new that's presented to us exactly so um you're doing a lot i mean you're doing you you're doing two main things as i see it i mean one is is you know teaching and running the 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 center in in colorado it's called what governable the media what was it yeah well, the so the the center yeah or yeah okay. the so we have a couple things going on here great stuff in this department i've run off to um at the university of colorado the land of some of my ancestors is uh the media economies design lab um, which was something i started um and that kind of explores experiments with ownership and governance in the online economy um, but also in the same department of media studies we also have a center on media religion and culture mm. um, which preceded me um, was built first by my uh, colleague Stuart Hoover and you know so is again a place to bridge some of these questions you know that where um, I get to think about the future of, of media economies, but also grounded in much longer legacies and imaginations of different religious cultures and, um, you know, and cultures of resistance and, and that sort of thing. So it's a wonderful mix that we have out here. And um, uh, it's been it's been a wonderful place to work. Yeah. And and I mean, I'm sure you you like us at at Queens College CUNY are now under the the, I don't know what to blame it on, but these new kind of financial restrictions and budget cuts and scariness. I mean, do you ever, do you worry for your survival? Uh, all the time. And certainly, for instance, COVID, um, you know, became an opportunity for, um, for a lot of, for a lot of cuts and deep challenges. And, um, you know, I especially fear for students. Um, you know, it's just, uh, with each passing year, the pressures on students just make it harder to learn, make it harder to um, make one's education a time in which one can be curious and do things that are frivolous and um, and and explore ideas that turn into dead ends, wander through the library or or whatever that looks like today. And and it it's that um, that kind of openness, that that kind of um, possibility of impracticality that I think is becoming harder and harder, uh, and and you see it on the faces of students. You see it yeah. in, in their ability to engage and and play in in class and in in their work outside. 
Yeah, it's almost like they have the the opposite to the to the ideal approach to education where they come and in our program they feel like, okay, in the next two years that I'm here, I better figure out what I'm going to do for a career and build a portfolio of work or a, a capstone project that will get me those jobs and get the connections to do it. Where what I would hope for is that these are two years. That, here's two years you can forget about that and actually experiment and play in, a, in, a, in, a, in an importantly useless fashion. That's right. That's right. I mean, the central function of the university, as far as I understand it, is to defy the logic of the state and the market um, yeah. to be a thing that that um, exists outside of those logics. Of course, it's in relationship to them, but but um, to, in some respects, do the things that they cannot do, and um, and we are at in you know a risk of that. At the same time, you know, this institution, this idea, has been around for so many centuries. Um, uh, that I also have a certain amount of faith in its ability to reinvent itself and uh, to persist. Um, I, you know, I, I think there's there are always these backlashes and and conflicts and challenges and you know diminution and expansion and you know we are in a you know a moment of crisis for sure. But um, I also have faith in these kinds of protocols and and. Um, inheritances um, that they are in some sense more resilient than we think they are. Yeah. I mean, and you do see it even, you know, freshman or sophomore college student, you know, goes into what's left of Queens College Library. And you do see them have sometimes I saw one, you know, just last semester, some kid in there beholding the stack, you know, of book. And they were like, oh, Look at this book next to that one that I was getting. Oh, and look at this one over here. And you could sort of see them pull back and say, wait a minute, there's a whole shelf of stuff that's here of interest to me that I wouldn't have thought of. And you go, yes, that's why you're here. Yes, keep going. <laughs> so it does happen, you know? Yeah, I need to do more field trips to the stacks. Um, I think that's that's something that we just need to, to practice is just that art of yeah. Useless time. I know. Well, you know, some of course people, people know useless yeah. time. I mean, you know it on the screen, you know, so forth. But there's something, you know, there are other, you know, f habits of useless time that that we need to teach, you know, that maybe we didn't need to teach before, but we need to teach uh, as kind of as as part of your uh, wonderful inheritance. Yeah, but, but I it's... promise on the first few journeys into the stacks, you will see more more vaping and 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 population <laughs> creation. Um which actually happens in the stacks of our library, um, then, then then you'll see that first before the academic uh, uh, wonder, but but eventually uh, you'll come upon. <laughs> they go hand in hand. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what was college for? Well, lest we forget <laughs> the other the other two main the other two or three main things we did there. I mean, the the founding of the University of Paris and these early universities are full of stories of riot, drunken riots, and you know, legal battles over damage to you know. <laughs> townies establishments i mean it is the the the, the very autonomy that the, the for instance the origins of the faculty meeting and faculty governance like lies in you know dealing with a um you know a particularly noxious and violent um <laughs> student riot in paris and oh so my God. You know, we we have to be we have to you know make sure to give credit where credit's due right all right right it's the other side <laughs> of lame is right the part that and there you just see them you know just at the barricade but yeah um it was around so it's interesting i mean where where what what i've been debating with myself lately and i guess with others and with you even though you're not around but it, with you as i read your book um, governable spaces. The AI representation of me yes. that you're debating. My projection. Your, yeah, it's an old yeah. school, old school projection of you <laughs> that I'm debating as I read governable spaces, democratic design for online life. And I think I lose most of my, my arguments, but you know, I, I, in the, in the early internet era, I was very enthusiastic about these technologies, things like Usenet and the well, were going to help us, uh, develop new strategies for government. And, and it, we would model what's happening online in the real world or even use some of these nice little text-based terminals to do stuff. Um, and I, I came 
all the way through to the other side now where I think everything has to happen in real life on the ground by, you know, people have to act like mycelia and have compassion and metabolize each other's trauma together in real space like Quakers, you know, live or it doesn't count. And the rest of it's crap. I don't know, the, the, our local Quaker community now has a screen on the wall <laughs> with, you know, black <laughs> rectangle Zoom square you know people and uh that's what uh uh you know i went once and and was like okay the zoom, <laughs> it's happened the zoom meeting hall the oh, quaker well. meeting is on zoom it's yeah. hybrid <laughs> i mean it's nice for the the for the utility value of the meeting i can understand it works but for the 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 creation of rapport and solidarity and and the fraternal quality i don't know it doesn't quite happen so when you when you when you talk about uh uh, uh governable spaces. I mean, it's interesting. You go, you go in two directions and I kind of want to, want to do both. The sort of one of them is how, uh, at least as I read it, is sort of how do we in the real world end up imitating the sort of the governance architectures implied by the platforms that we're on. If you live on Facebook and that, then you you kind of expect Facebookification of your your decision making in real life. But then the other way is then how can we um, take sort of the best features and the most important features of real life democratic process and then imitate them in an online way? I mean, is that sort of so were you sort of feeling that you were working in those in those two directions at once? Yeah, yeah, and that's the that's the kind of the causality question is the hardest one for me, but I do think it's there, right? The sense that that how we behave in our online lives has shaped stuff far beyond what appears to be just our like the communities we happen to be in. And, you know, the my kind of motivation for being inclined to think that comes from a you know, a tradition of political thought going back to Alexis de Tocqueville through um, anti-colonial uh, scholars and activists like C.L.R. James uh, to you know the Robert Putnam books and Bowling Alone and this this kind of kind of tradition, um, you know, and and w- which all say that democracy at any large scale depends on what we do in our everyday life, and so that forces us to ask, what are we doing in our everyday life? What what kinds of practices, habits, skills are we developing? Tocqueville talked about associations as as schools of democracy and um you know and and so i you know i want to hold both of the things that you um of of the positions you talked about you know that kind of that desire to do democracy in new and fresh and dynamic ways in online space that was so much part of the intention of a lot of early online communities and which recurs with each new kind of wave of of online life um but also, I think we need to ask, like, what are the things that people were actually doing, right? Like, there's a, a point in in uh, the book where I point out this passage about the well, which you talked about, which is an early BBS uh, bulletin board system, you know, where people were having often their first conversations in online space. And um, there was this intention to organize democratically. Um, you know, this is what we're going to eventually do. But it it for many, many years, that never quite happened. Only after the Wells heyday did it actually, after a few different sales of the thing, where it just got bought and sold by people without any user's permission, um, did it finally end up becoming a kind of co-owned thing by some leading users, something approaching a kind of cooperative, only after um, you know the stakes had declined significantly. Well, we didn't so think I, about it. I mean, we didn't, I mean, and that goes to, right. to your original arguments. <laughs> exactly. I mean, because, be, but- we we didn't I guess we didn't think about it partly because we were dumb and partly because it just didn't occur to us to think about it. I mean, I always yeah. talk about, you know, I was a raver in the early days. It didn't occur to us that we were claiming public space for yeah. our rituals. We were just there's a parking lot. Let's it wasn't park. I guess it was private space, but whatever. Just just put up our speakers and do it. We didn't realize, oh, this is actually a political thing and we're not charging any money and we didn't it was it was so in the internet i mean you you point this out i mean the early bbs's the bulletin board services that i was on one kid owned the computer that we all dialed into so he was in charge of what happened and it's amazing to hear those those early testimonies of the people who were those sysadmins of the early admin of the early systems and 
because the thing is plugged into their wall, right? The, the, the computer that everybody's talking on is plugged into their wall. They are, you know, the host on a good day. They're the, you know, you're a visitor in their house and they're the judge, jury, and executioner. And this is the origin point of what I end up calling, you know, to use a very ahistorical, a you know, um, uh, uh, term, implicit feudalism. Right. This right. idea that that while calling ourselves democratic, we're actually practicing what, um, you know, self understood enlightenment French people um, uh, uh, thought the Middle Ages did, which was this very rigid and and structured and hierarchical and and kind of antique um, way of organizing the Middle Ages were actually much more interesting than that. Right. But um, nevertheless, we end up with this system of a kind of astonishing um, rigidity, where the admins and mods of an online space are essentially in absolute control, and they they exercise their power through censorship and exile, and um, we've end up uh, ended up developing these kind of by default, and then adopting them into the design these practices into the design of online systems. Since then, we've come to treat it as if this is okay. Um, we have come to treat this kind of structure as if it's normal and that there's no other way we might right. organize. And but, but it's not necessarily all bad, right? So when we're no. kids, you want, you know, first off, the kid who's running the BBS, who's the sysop, is probably someone who's been teased and ostracized his whole life. And I'm saying him because they were almost all boys. And now, except for Stacey Horn, who did it for Echo, Echo NYC, which was a very mm -hmm. different kind of network. And we could yeah. look at that as an example. But but it was some some poor little nerd kid who's never been in charge of anything. And now it's his. And, and second, because there are a lot of strangers and things, sometimes it was good to know, you know, you go into a party, your mom's going to say, whose house is it? Whose parents are there? Who's is that? A, that's not a good kid. You're not going to his house on Friday night. So this is you're going and you know that the behavior is going to be moderated. I remember um, Howard Rheingold tried a few different one of the original virtual community yeah, yeah. pioneers tried a bunch of things. And then finally he did Howard Rheingold's brainstorms was his bulletin board. And he's like, look, this is my living room. If you do something I think is wrong, I'm kicking you out. Boom. And we all trusted Howard. He's not going to kick you out if you're just if you're trying to not be an asshole. You know, if you're an inadvertent asshole. But if you're a dick, you know, he's going to say goodbye. And that's not bad there. But maybe it's like on Twitter when it's an Elon Musk having that feudal sysop control. Maybe it changes. It it changes as soon as it becomes no longer a living room, right? As soon as it becomes something that that starts to seem like a commons you know something that it, that people rely on you know the the logic of a living room is well you can always go to somebody else's living room but there are some you know increasingly these online spaces are places that we don't have the option to leave we depend on them for our livelihood for our ability to participate in um you know in, in what we need for um our survival um they become places where we form you know peer to peer relationships separate from the relationship with the, the admin they become more than just a living room and um and and at that point that structure is really inadequate but it's been very hard to move out of that structure in part because of culture and i think it does come to that question of like we didn't think of it right it, and that goes back to you know this famous essay by um, Joe Freeman about the social movements of the 60s, this tyranny of structurelessness, the way in which, you know, people with a certain kind of privilege often do have the um, tendency to not think about governance structure, just assuming everything will turn out okay. It um, because it has for them until Okay then. for them, yeah. <laughs> you know, because they, they'll, they're, they get the power by default and other people are kind of cut out and they don't even have to think about that and notice that. Um, and so it's cultural on one side is this is this desire to say, oh, let's have a world without politics. Let's have a world, you know, in which like ideas flow freely and, the you know, there's a meritocracy of people and ideas that will work out great for us. Um, but, you know, Joe Freeman back in the early 70s pointed out, no, this actually doesn't work great for a lot of us. And so, you know, there are limitations to that culture. But then it's also a technical thing um, independent of that culture, which is to say that you know, the structure of the early internet, you know, developed as a kind of 
tool for research institutions funded by the Pentagon to talk to each other um, depended on this logic of servers. And servers are always plugged into somebody's wall. And there's always a kind of single point of failure. And there were a bunch of experiments in the early in the early internet. That, you know, I'm sure you encountered these where people did try to do democratic decision making. I look, for instance, at like Lambda Moo, this kind of crazy online game that had a famous like um, case of virtual sexual assault. Yeah. Um, and and um, you know, the well is another case. Um, a number of these early systems, uh, you know, I know a guy here in Colorado who ran a BBS network um, that was a kind of d- democracy and they actually voted him out. Um, but by and large, what people discovered was, hey, wait a second, you know, at the end of the day, I own the server. I can unplug it when I want. I have the legal liability for the server sitting in my house. So I really need to have that control. And so all the technical systems were kind of built to reinforce that idea. That that the norm should be, you know, one person or entity has absolute control, and this um, th- this kind of um, technical bias plus the the cultural bias plus then eventually, hey, we can make a lot of money off of this idea of central control over servers. Um, start reinforcing each other, and the pattern becomes so ubiquitous that we don't think anything else is possible. And then, you know, I I. You know, the critical moment for me in in writing this book was talking to my mother about her garden club, right? Talking, you know, hearing her describe the civic association in which she gets elected president and is still accountable to bylaws and can get voted out and all these things. You know, same as like yeah. countless civic associations and they probably, everywhere. They probably say the pledge allegiance to the flag at the opening of every meeting. You know, don't don't get me started. I mean, it's it's. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's got all kinds of. I like of, those um, things. Those are very comforting. Those little <laughs> you know, Girl Scouts kind of organizations. Yeah. But but the the very fact that that would be a default in something like a garden club, and that those defaults are almost universally unavailable in online spaces, that we would have bylaws, that we would, that even the power holders would be accountable to some kind of rule um, is is so foreign to how we think about online space. Right. Well, they're startups. That, it's IP. This is ownership and domination. They're trying to create monopolies. It's a different set of goals. It's Well, it's a different set of goals for certainly for the companies, but it's also those aren't the goals of the communities, right? Those aren't right. the goals of those of us who are just like doing stuff on the Internet. Um, you know, there's no necessary reason why um, our expectations would have to be set that way. Uh, we could have done this, you know, in other fashion, um, but in some respects, we kind of forgot you know, to import those habits of, of democratic practice in everyday life into into our online lives and you know this was especially poignant to me when i was like we were talking about platform cooperativism earlier when i was running like big mailing lists full of people trying to build cooperatives and realizing wait how do i do this democratically like I, nothing in the tool set of this email list i'm running enables me to know like when a decision i'm making is accountable to the people in it you know there is no mechanism for me to Right. Um, you know, call a poll or or whatever it is to know whether, you know, I just have to feel my way through and be the autocrat. Yeah. No, if you're working with more than one person, then basically it's like a team of some kind, you know, and it's 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 a team in the industrial model of team, not a uh, group in the in the democratic sense of group. But it doesn't even really governance then doesn't occur to people, partly because the the civic role of these technologies was very quickly replaced by the the entertainment role. You know, it's like, how long did public access television, remember to get a cable uh, contract, the, the company would have to give like two channels to the community. And it was just blank most of the time. No one no one sees that opportunity for local media. And the same with the internet, which may have once been about civics. It, it's weird. For me, the turning point, and and I, I look at, at your book in some way, because I'm egotistical, as a bookend to my own um, open source democracy, which is uh-huh. this book I wrote in like during the Howard Dean campaign, which was the first one to sort of make use of the internet for politics. But Those were the days. M- yeah, but my problem, what I was yelling about then was, oh, great, you're using the internet to raise money. 
for your campaign to do sort of an early version of of Kickstarter for your campaign. And Obama, you're going to go use it too in that sort of way. But then nobody was looking at the follow. Well, that's not the Internet's not here to help you raise money or at least not only it's here to then help you govern. What about using the net's possibility to, to actually create uh, uh, civic spaces and it felt like that was the that was the real possibility for an open source democracy it would be a participatory uh, uh, but I guess what I didn't realize was the reason why that didn't really happen was because whatever the biases of the technology the biases of the actual platforms most people used were not towards civic participation they looked very little like Usenet yeah and they I, I mean I wouldn't d- dismiss like the the educational or the the sorry the um the uh, entertainment right because because when you look at like these civic associations and in other aspects of life you know we have uh you know across europe there are like cooperatively owned sports teams like and even like a local um sports club you know is often you know collectively governed in some way there are bylaws there are structures there are people who are on the board and things like that. Um, when you talk about like, uh, uh, music groups, uh, 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 you know, dance troops, all kinds of producers of entertainment actually in many offline spaces, um, self-govern in the kinds of reasonable ways that are, are utterly missing here. So the idea that it, the, you know, the use case of entertainment, I think is actually precisely you know, an important one is is something that we should be concerned with. And even to the point where, for instance, I've been building a, a, a d- doing my some of my software development experiments on can we actually do this again? Um, uh, I, you know, going back to your your book about um, about coding, you know, that the, you need to, you know, in order to really understand these systems, like get into the code, learn how to play. Um, I've been trying to build um, game mods um, Mm. for multiplayer games, you know, recognizing that this is a space where people are experimenting with, with online sociality with relatively low stakes. This is where we should be building and and developing a lot of these tools. And then they'll spread out from there. Then they'll come to civic space because actually all politics, you know, like a political campaign is a game anyway. Yeah. Um, So why not just test it out and, you know, in game space, I don't, I don't see that distinction, but certainly, you know, the question of, of, um, you know, the, the, the opportunity and, and, and also I, I, something that you point to that's really important is this sense that this belief that politics is, is something that looks like people voting in an offline kind of world and electing people to this offline capital or whatever it is. And the internet is this thing that is like separate from that, right? That's in some ways what I'm trying to oppose, both in the sense that I, I think you know, we we focus so much on what is the internet doing to democracy, and then we ask, well, what should our democratic systems do to the internet to fix it? Right? It's all about like democracy on the one side and the internet on the other, and right. that I think is the fundamental problem. Is we need to actually be thinking about how do we get that democracy or whatever we need to call it for the future into into this internet because there is no distinction anymore. Right. It's a That's false what, distinction. Right. Jeff Jarvis keeps talking about that when he's when he's teaching his classes at, at, at CUNY, that there's like, there's no such thing as the internet. There's like, right. there's no, That's it's, great. it's just, it's, this is <laughs> it. So when you, when you see like, uh, you know, last week in the uh, congressional hearings, you see like the internet chiefs or whatever, the CEOs and the owners like Zuckerberg or whoever sitting there in front of Congress. It's like, oh, we are going to now we're going to make laws to change the way your Internet works. So because your Internet is doing stuff that's changing the way people see us. And it's like, what if it is one? What if it is one thing? And and clearly those politicians are performing for the internet because they're not getting anything else done. That's the only right. possible explanation for what they're doing in asking all these dumb questions and you know and 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 pontificating but never coming to a solution. And it's an adoption of a practice. I mean, you were talking about you know Usenet, and I mean, you and I both know, for instance, this tool Lumio, um, right. which is a, a a tool designed for self governance. And one thing, you know, I use Lumio all the time just because several communities I'm part of use it. It's a it's kind of a forum thread that um, you know forum platform that has this additional set of features for making decisions. And it actually kind of totally transforms how you approach a conversation with people online because unlike in your average what like 
Facebook, Instagram, whatever, uh, YouTube, God forbid, um, you know, comment thread where the, the incentive is kind of like flame out and, you know, attack all, you know, the war of all against all. Um, instead, the the incentive is like, oh, actually, you're supposed to come to some consensus and use these tools to like develop a proposal that people are actually going to want to get behind. And um, because those tools are available, the incentive and the dynamic shifts, your goal is not to, you know, rail against everybody. Your goal is to make a proposal that people can actually get behind. That's winning, right. you know, in that space. And and it just is this kind of exception that proves the rules. Like once you use that, you realize, oh, every other space I'm in is designed, you know, for the exact opposite purpose. And there was never any intention to get us to solve a problem. You know, I, I think similarly, you know, things like what goes by the name cancel culture is a is a kind of symptom of of systems in which, um, you know, that are designed against and without, you know, the goal of ever coming to a resolution to a, a conflict. The goal is to, you know, cause as much, you know, self-expression as possible that can be used for adver advertising. Um, the second you start designing systems for actually solving problems, um, you know, I, I right. think those kinds of behaviors, you know, would would become less appealing. You'd have alternatives to them at least. Right. Because part of the online the 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 quest for an ever more granular online identity, you know, helps engender this notion that politics is about getting to the essence of your true, most honest self-expression. Oh, yeah. Where kind of that kind of doesn't matter. It's like, what if you're instead incentivized? How do we stop violence? Like, I mean, there's, there's like, you know what I mean? And it may or may not involve other people knowing who and what you are and stand for. You know, it's which is different. No, it's and it's interesting how a lot, you know, even in the context of people who are trying to build like democratic tooling for the internet, one thing that drives me nuts is that they're often designed around the idea that people have static preferences and the job of technology is simply to manifest those preferences like to tell you which, you know, random like eighth party political candidate you should, you know, best aligns with your belief systems. You know, totally neglecting the fact that the whole point of politics is persuasion and compromise and strat and strategy and and, you know, like I change my mind in every conversation I have. Right. Um, you know, and 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 you know, and and this idea that, you know, the goal is simply to reflect something that's already there is, you know, this stuff I, I to me it goes down to this question of like what how does technology um, allow us to be human. You know, it's why, like, I love this podcast, right? Yeah. That's what it's all about for me. You know, I'm, I'm a, you know, half Jewish Catholic social teaching, um, you know, devotee. And I, and for me, it's all about human dignity. It's like, what is right. it that these tools are evoking for us and inviting us into becoming, inviting us into seeing in ourselves? Right. And that's what, the, you know, that's, that's ultimately the stakes for me. And not, uh, and, and not to take you out of that, but I think it's, I, if this is intellectualizing it, then just tell me and slap me around and it's fine. But um, so early in early in your book, you you talked about something, and I actually tried to point out a sentence that was confusing to me because it was so important what you were saying. Was it kind of you were referring to kind of an an early American colonialist idea that people thought that if sort of Native Americans and indigenous people were going to get anything like democracy, the only form of it they would get is because we from the West are going to come and impose it on them and teach them. You know, this sort of this. So there's this sort of enlightenment understanding of democracy as this sort of ideal that comes from sort of platonically educated elites that we understand now democracy, this great thing from the heavens, and we're going to bring it down to you. And I think even today, there's this sense that that imposed enlightenment democracy is this kind of Zionism, technocracy, globalism, European imposition of artificial idealistic frameworks on real people. And there's there's another not that it is, but I th I guess it falls it, it can fall into that trap, which is why I feel like you're suggesting that there is 
uh, almost more like what David Graeber describes in that great book with all those different worlds, uh, all those yeah. different civilizations finding different forms of democracy, that there's kind of a, 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 a more natural, bottom-up, pro-human, participatory democracy that can emerge from a, 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 a an appropriately kind of uh, curated or or uh, uh, I don't even want to say educated, nurtured community. And, and I love that that book, The Dawn of Everything, on the Graeber and Wengro book. Um, you know, I, I read it while I was writing this one, and and you know, turned through it in three days, and you know, could have read it three more times yeah. over. It's, um, uh, you know, not because you know, and I think there's a lot to be, you know, critiqued there and so forth, but there. Are couple things that are so vital to what you're saying. One is that, you know, it tells the story of the enlightenment as emerging through encounter, right? Not right. through a single culture discovering something, you know, which was nonsense because again, you know, the middle ages were full of really interesting democratic structures. Um, and, um, you know, for instance, a, you know, I think of a case like of a town called Luca in Italy, where where they had uh, a statue of Jesus Christ as the king of this town so that no none of the nobles could become king, right? You know, they had all kinds of clever ways of keeping power in check. Um, and, uh, uh, but that encounter with with indigenous communities, you know, Wang, uh, Wangro and, and Graeber argue was really like the wellspring of beginning to be able to articulate democracy in, in, a, in a modern sense. And what I just love about that book too is the variety, is that 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 sense, that argument that human beings have lots of ways to, to self-govern. And um, out of that, reading that book, um, my a colleague and I, Federica Caragatti, um, mm -hmm. who's a political scientist, started this project called Governance Archaeology, where we started more systematically cataloging, wow. you know, diverse uh, uh, practices of self-governance throughout history around the world, um, and starting to develop partnerships with communities that are stewards of these practices. Um, because we believe that it is deeply important to have access to a much broader range of repertoires. Um, and, and that to me is the dream, right? Is, is to, um, of online spaces is to be able to have this low cost space of experimentation with lots of different governance practices and, and possibilities, um, because we're able to start and stop and, and morph these things much more easily than we can, you know, with territorial governments. And so we can stop confusing democracy with the U S constitution or whatever. Um, we can instead recognize this has to be an ongoing and evolving tradition. Um, in conversation with a much wider range of of legacies that we can draw on, and you know, I think of like the, you know, Jefferson's Library, right? It's such a crucial, you know, thing. It is. It's you know, it was the founding library, the set of books that started the the Library of Congress ended up getting burned down. Blah blah blah. But it um it it is this signal of you know, it's full of books about ancient Greece and Rome. Right. And it's him kind of trying to attach the government he wanted to build to this particular legacy. And every time we build something new, we are drawing from a repertoire of what we think we respect in the past. Of course, he didn't have books about, you know, the indigenous cultures that he was also borrowing ideas from. Um, but um, and and at the same time, denigrating and trying to destroy. Um, but uh, uh, but we need to be intentional today about about our repertoires of the past, our understanding of the past, even while we open the door to the future. And, and the past, I think, from my mother's garden club to, you know, so many different um, uh, uh, habits of governance around the world, all the, they, w when you s contrast them to what we do in online space, it's embarrassing. Right. You know, it was embarrassing to me when I heard my mother talk about her garden club while I was trying to solve a problem in this, like, large email list and realizing oh shit like you're doing you're doing this so much better than we are um what is wrong with us right and it's so simple you know it's so simple they don't <laughs> they don't even need a a computer to do it but you know, so there's really a couple of reasons why this happens so if the first and we kind of talked about it is this implicit feudalism of these platforms because some dude owns it and that's the way it is and because it's it's it it has that you know feudal style 
culture, it represses the, the what you call, and I, I like this term, the effective voice of the people there. Then the second thing, though, because you talk about the past, you know, well, a lot of people remember the past and the American way as a land grab, as homesteading. Yeah. And we there was a great book about homesteading. I forgot the title of it, but the subtitle was Homesteading on the Digital Frontier. Yeah, that's hired Rheingold on the well, right? Yeah. Oh, right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah, the virtual and community. Yeah. Virtual community, homesteading on the digital frontier. And it yeah. sounded great at the time, but then you realize, yeah. oh, wait a minute. Homesteading <laughs> the tr- is people, is basically white guys going running out there and putting a flag on the ground saying, this is mine. Yeah. Which is yeah. not a very commons-based approach to <laughs> to the, a new a new a, a new territory, and that that metaphor is so alive and well in you know it, I mean it was part of the well moment in the '90s, right? Homesteading frontier, um, and then like for instance with Ethereum, you know the the blockchain platform, the first some of the first versions of it were codenamed homestead and frontier you know i mean the the language just persists and it is you know on the one hand it you know it's an ambivalent language for me um the homesteading acts of the starting during the civil war you know signed by the first signed by abraham lincoln was in a sense a move of economic democracy saying like a democratic society needs small holders, you know, people, families to hold small amounts of land and 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 to own them, and to and that is the basis of like an economic democracy alongside our political democracy. There's something that sounds good, you know, yeah, something powerful For, about that. Forty but acres and a mule, yeah. Ex- that's another side of it, right? Um, the unrealized side, yeah. Um, the but but. Then there is the side of homesteading that is putting up a fence on somebody else's land, um, uh, uh, interrupting the movement of the buffalo that are somebody else's livelihood, um, that uh, 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 imposing this concept of, of property on a world that does not and rejects that that logic, um, and and also imposing a kind of patriarchal rule over the family where you know only one person in the household is the citizen, right? And right. and I think that that set of associations also carries really well with with on with with the kinds of logic of implicit feudalism you know the the idea that okay i start a subreddit i get to be in control this is my homestead this is my thing and i am you know i am the boss and nobody can stop me and um i contrast this to this idea from bell hooks of of the home place which is the kinds of spaces that people in that same time period made especially you know black women um homes that were counter that were liberating and counter to a world of oppression they were they were a, a space of of liberation where people could be human in an inhuman society and and what i like about that is it it gives some credit you know what i don't want to say with implicit feudalism is because the tw- the technical systems constrain our governance possibilities that people aren't then doing cool things anyway and i think there's so many home places around the internet you know we know that we all have our home places the places that despite you know the fact that they're on platforms run by you know um the the kind of antichrist or whatever um they uh still are places that we find are able to to yeah, find power there's and, I nooks mean, and crannies it's all fine exactly. but you know but as a kid i smoked my best dope behind the 7-eleven too on there right. and that's, that's some right. evil corporation right <laughs> we find our nooks i mean dope now that would be utterly rejected as not even dope i'm sure by today's standards but but Right. There were these nooks and crannies. So you're on Discord and it's like, well, so then someone's going to come and yell at me and say, oh, well, Discord may be owned by this or I've got something on Substack and they're telling me, oh, no, you can't be there because that's the platform for Nazis. So I got to leave. Or and it's like, but I'm, I got a nice little there's a nice little nook or cranny of little team human people and we're talking and we have to like, have a language for that. I mean, we have to recognize we're, you know, to put it in religious terms again, we're living in the fall. Like there's no, there's no safe place here, you know? And I, um, I can be very lonely, you know, like running Linux and, 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 <laughs> um, you know, which I do and, and <laughs> all the things I do all the things, you know? Um, but, but, you know, the more I, I pursue purity, the lonelier I am. And right. you know, we just can't do that. We but have to do this, this together. But there's this, I mean, it could be because I'm getting old and don't have the energy but uh, often when i see like the governance the online governance people coming i just think 
oh man, there's going to be so much spinning of wheels here. I mean, there were some great folks that came onto the Team Human Discord. And these are people who are from uh, uh, like a third level blockchain cooperative universe. And they're like, okay, we're going to develop a governance structure for this Discord, right? And it's a Discord that's got maybe, you know, between 30 and 70 active people on it, you know, once a week. And it's like, and so there are all these categories. Okay, how are we going to organize categories and subcategories? And who's going to be in charge of it? And how is this going to happen? And people are like leaving the server going, oh my God, this has become so much about itself. Can't we just talk about just, it's, there's a, there's a place at which it's like good enough. And I guess I, I wonder sometimes, I'm happy for people to say, okay, let's look at whether or not and how blockchain governance can help us in the world. But most of the blockchain governance I'm seeing is governance of the blockchain itself. You know what I mean? It's like this solipsistic, let's create, the first thing we've got to do is figure out the governance that we're going to use for our governance defining blockchain. <laughs> totally. And it's a, um, it's a, uh, you know, guilty as charged. I've destroyed <laughs> communities by by uh, stepping in and trying to trying to like start the G conversation. I know how how absolutely noxious it can be, and um, it's one reason. For instance, um, you know, an obsession of mine since finishing the book has been attention economies. Has been like designing, trying to design much thinner and more like appropriate structures for where communities are um trying to imagine what would it look like if we actually won you know like how many meetings do we actually want to go to not that many right um so let's design for that and then and then um it you know it it, it also just comes down to i mean for me it's it's been part of why i adopted this language in my work with cooperatives often of exit to community is saying like look you know your community is your destination once you've earned it you know not mm -hmm. your um you know it's not necessarily you, you know you don't want to build a whole set of thick things you got to figure out what you're doing first before you know you really build spend all this time building complex structures but um but there is this you know i i you know since you brought up blockchain i, I you know i want to kind of to point to that because I do think it is it's it's there's something important there that I cling to even as like the uh Rome is burning in the most right. um in the most right. noxious well, sort of way. Just because people are using it for NFT rug pulls doesn't mean there's not something in blockchain whether it's the authentication I don't think it's necessarily mining and tokens but some kind of public recordy thing could be cool. And to me, what's interesting about it is that it it resists. It is it is an opportunity to actually change the subject from that server centric law network structure, right? Um, that has fed and fueled implicit feudalism. Um, a blockchain is many many things, but by default, it is user governed, right? The people who are nodes on the network generally have some kind of power over that network. Is it and though? That's the thing. I mean, yes, in theory they are, but I'm in so many of these conversations, great people, super smart people, you know, Amber Case and all those folks who really think about this. And it seems to me like the dream they have is to somehow they set this thing on automatic that it, that you let go and then it runs things somehow rather than the people. And it's almost like I'd rather Howard Rheingold run it than a blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's one of the deep debates, right? In, the, right? in that particular world is it, you know, it's often a kind of Bitcoin versus Ethereum debate, but it goes deeper than that, is this question of the people who want this to ultimately come down to people and the people who want it ultimately to come down to like the machine. And they're kind of like the neo- gold standard people, right? right. I mean, and this is an old expressed, debate. This and they're is both the debate. expressed way too, um, uh, they're both expressed way too extreme as well. Yeah, yeah. So it's and like, we talk about debate. people, you'll get like Elon Musk saying, oh, we need um, direct democracy. Everyone's going to vote on everything. On you Mars, know? only on yeah. Mars, not yeah. in my factory, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but but uh, no, I mean, this is the same debate that people are having in the 1890s over the gold standard and 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 all this stuff. I mean, this is, we've been through this, but, um, but it is the case that, even despite like even even though the the dominant forces in the blockchain crypto world have been all about financialization and this kind of libertarian dream space and all this stuff just because of the structure of the technology 
it has produced like an influx of people actually trying to build technologies for collective governance and collective decision making in online space using online things that has not happened before. Um, you can find like a few, you know, source code bits here and there from like voting systems in the BBS era. Very few. Um, there are like many uh, uh, platforms that people have built for collective governance of blockchains. And this is just, a, a, you know, this was totally skipped. This was never part of Web 2. This was never really part of Web 1. Um, and, um, and, and because of the structure of this network that does at some point ask for some kind of consensus uh, to occur in order to change the behavior of the code, um, suddenly this governance becomes a problem. It becomes something that people have to figure out. And it, it, you know, it, it, in a sense, it, it, it demonstrates what I'm talking about, which is that we are, you know, we've, we've, we've adopted network designs that have, have, um, kind of kicked the can on the, on the question of governance and essentially deferred it to whoever has the most power in the world outside rather than having governance built into the systems themselves. And, you know, for all the like evil that blockchains have done in the world, I think we have to see that fact that having a different kind of network structure, um, actually can open doors for explorations of governance in a way that uh, that that our existing dominant uh, network structures have inhibited. So then are you saying a structure that would be based on what we learn from the blockchain or that somehow blockchain would be involved in the way like a nation like the U.S. governs itself? Um, what's interesting to me is less what a nation like the U.S. governs itself because I think, or how it governs itself, there might be ways in which like cryptographic verification or something like that could be useful in making votes more trustworthy. But what's interesting to me about blockchains is that they create network native institutions, um, institutions that do not rely on government power to do things. So, um, you know, two of the applications that people have used blockchains for, um, one is currency, um, another is uh, incorporating essentially organizations. Those are two things that presently we rely on governments and essentially militaries and police forces to do. Um, and blockchains do those things, but in a different way. They do it in a way that relies on on the network, on computing, on on economic dynamics. And that to me opens a door. Um, not to say that like I want to jump into the blockchain utopia because right now it is definitely dystopian. <laughs> um, but but it is true, you know, the boosters are right that this technology does enable um, the the it, uh, does enable the possibility of carrying out things that we currently rely on states and military, you know, essentially threats of violence for, um, and do that on a network that relies on other kinds of incentive and, um, you know, and other kinds of carrots and sticks, so to speak. Well, in and, your, in and your dream, opens, what does yeah. that look like? What might I, it look like? So the, an image I end the book on, Yeah, this is not something that I'm claiming of the present, you know, blockchain right. world. That's right? all right. But an image that I end the book on is, is this website, nativeland.ca, right? It's a map of indigenous territories. Um, it's a it's a map in which there's a lot of overlap in which territories overlap each other. I could you, you know you could imagine that taken much further. I mean when I think about what what does an average day look like? I'm talking to people in many different geographies through screens and you know the internet. Um, what does my kind of political citizenship look like if it were you know network? you know, built on networks, it would be distributed. It would be, it would be all over. I would have maybe multiple forms of citizenship. Um, I would be, um, uh, I wouldn't just be reliant on my, you know, my territorial identity as, as the sole thing that gives me, so, you know, citizenship or sovereignty, but instead to recognize that there are many ways of, um, many places of imagining ourselves as, as political subjects, as full citizens, um, as, as, as belonging. I, I guess what I'm, what I'm looking for is a, is a, uh, not that you're doing a startup here, but a use case. Uh-huh. Um, like it's a, it's a, it's an old use case. I mean, like, for instance, you know, you and I have ancestors 
uh, our, you know, our, our descendants of, of, uh, you know, the Jewish diaspora, right? Uh, that is a community that has operated through a networked infrastructure. Uh, we are, it is an, it is a networked people, right? As much as even like the nation state of Israel tries to claim, you know, now there is one place. No, it is, it's a networked people. And there are many, many networked people. Um, and, and there are many other ways to be a networked person. You know, there have also been, you know, for instance, you know, uh, uh, people who see their primary identity as being with an order, you know, I'm a Franciscan. Okay. I don't care what country I'm in. 99% of my behavior is governed by the fact that I'm a, you know, Franciscan friar or, you know, a Benedictine monk or, you know, a, 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 a Theravada Buddhist practitioner. Um, you know, these kinds of networked identities have been with us, you know, throughout human history. Um, the nation state as the dominant and sole um, uh, establisher of power and and um, and might and erector of borders and controller of land, you know, is a is a relatively new phenomenon. And I think there is resilience in having, you know, a more, you know, a, a wider range of options available to us, um, a wider range of possibilities for who we could be. And I think there is a really dangerous side to this. I mean, like the there's this idea out of like you know, startup land of a network state, which is essentially a, a startup nation, you know, built by venture capital for profit. Um, you know, let's replace the state with venture capital. That's a very, very real, um, you know, that's kind of the dominant, you know, driving imagination, you know, for a lot of people in these contexts. And, you know, what I'm trying to point to is, you know, is a sense in which I think they're, they're interested in something that's real. Like, I, I don't think it's here now, but I think it is, there's something about that where, that we're maybe going toward. And if that's the case, we need to have alternative imaginations other than, you know, the, the mold of the startup um, right. as the way in which we imagine these other ways of being. Yeah. I mean, I guess there's somehow there's a sense of relief for people in that. If we could just follow Musk oh. or Teal or somebody and they'll Let build them the run the thing. show. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and and to be fair, part of me, not that I want them to do it, I would love there just to be a mayor in my town who makes the decisions and just I want to agree with them most of the time. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Good totally, enough. totally. I don't want to be constantly like AI examined for my preferences and and or or forced to get, you know, content. I mean, most issues like we should just be able to kind of, you know, trust each other. We have I mean, yes, yes. I want a absolutely. proxy proxy to someone who knows better than me. <laughs> but um, yeah, but I guess, you know, and it was Jefferson talked about this, too. There's some there's some kind of responsibility we have for civics, you know, for actually maintaining those things. And luckily, as your as your your mom or grandma, you know, can show you, you know, they we've got the rule books. I mean, people if people have left easy rule books for civics if you just want to do it in a straightforward and simple way. It's true and yet I you know, I think we do have to rethink those rule books, you know. I don't yeah. I don't I, and and that's the in this age know, the, in a digital fucking that's age. That's right. I mean, if we're in 500 you know, when I look at, for instance, like my password manager and the hundreds of places I have accounts and I think, OK, do I want to go to meetings for all of those? No, of course not. Of course. Right. not. But there are a few of them that do matter to me. And and, um, you know, and I do think there is important and, and, and for the rest of them that don't matter to me, I at least want to know that they have a pretty strong reason to not betray me. Right. Right. You know, it, you know just to be able to have that confidence that, you know, that that most of the time, as you say, the mayor is doing a job. I mean, with my, you know, campus union, like I'm a very bad union citizen. Like I sometimes go to meetings and, and that's because like, I know a lot of the people who are in charge and like, I trust them. I think they're great. I think they're doing fine. And, um, and that's cool, you know? Yeah. I'm but <laughs> would you look at how many things like, you know, I've got a teacher's retirement account in this thing called TIAA CREF. And in there, there are these funds like S&P 500 index funds, which means I have shares in 500 companies that are doing bad things to people. And 
they I could participate in their governance. You know, yeah. if if there maybe were a blockchain that let me do it, you know, at scale, right? <laughs> it I I mean to me it's it's you know the 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 key question it, it, the, the key challenge is just to open up the question, be able to say like look, we have we have the chance to design what are the things that we actually want and expect and need, you know, um, right. to, to be able to, um, uh, to, to find the right balance somehow, rather than just assuming, oh, there's only one way that's going right. to be done. And, and it, at the best moments, like in the, in like these weird subcultures of governance obsessed crypto people, you see them like coming up with actually novel governance structures, uh, and novel voting systems, you know, voting that is continuous. So your vote is always sitting there and you can withdraw it at any time. And, you know, things that we just don't get to try, um, in, 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 you know the the systems that we tend to associate with democracy, and that is kind of the plea here from the beginning. It's a plea, you know, to people designing technologies. It's a plea to communities who have the capacity to experiment. It's also a plea to you know to policymakers to say like, stop making rules um, based on telling the CEOs to have more power and and control <laughs> their lives more. You know, like start making rules that actually empower people to have. Uh, uh, you know, to have the ability to have a say, for instance, like problems with the gig economy, you know, enable gig worker unions, you know, enable, enable those workers to define for themselves what they want problems in social media, you know, great give, um, you know, ensure that, that communities have the ability to make decisions for themselves and solve problems and address, you know, conflicts on their own terms, um, you know, problems with like, big infrastructures and people getting overcharged and all this stuff like great um you know cooperative uh broadband systems work really really well um and there's a really good track record for that let's enable them to you know get financing and grow um you know there's there's a whole set of approaches that we could use to rethink how we do how we solve problems with the internet and with society that the internet like is in this kind of death grip with and um and uh, and and but you know we have a choice. We can we can we can address those problems through autocracy, or we can address them through democracy. Right. And the interesting thing is that I, I would argue, even though I mean autocracy sounds um, Trumpish, I I would argue that there's a sense of disenfranchisement on both ends of the political spectrum yeah. that you know would would hear a, a would, would be called to action. You know, I, I think that they would, they both want the kind of outcome you're talking about. They both want some sense of, of yeah. recognition and participation that they're not getting in the current system. I, I really believe that. And, and part of that belief came to me from um, reading the, like, the minutes of meetings from the populist party in the 1880s when I was working on my last book, uh, you know, the everything for everyone was about the cooperative movement. And, you know, I was trying to figure out who are these populists? We keep, everyone hates populism yeah. or like the, you know, New York times hates populism, uh, these days. So what, you know, who, what is populism? And, you know, there were these people who called themselves populists. They elected the governor of Colorado in 1892. Um, and they were actually the forerunners of the progressive movement. Um, and the, the leaders were very, very, intentional in that in that work about um they knew that demagogues could show up and they were, they were dealing with a lot of angry people but they were very intentional about enabling democracy in everyday life they saw that as the antidote and and that's why they supported farmer cooperatives and unions and all kinds of practices where people could solve their problems together and feel their own power and that was resting on the belief that if people feel their own, their own power they won't turn to the demagogues um, and and they saw that anger that people have that disenfranchisement as something that could go in in either direction you know it could go toward demagoguery or it could go toward you know a real healthy social movement and the difference for them was that was enabling people to have that feeling um that you know that, that they have a that they have a say, they don't have to just turn to the person who says, I alone can fix it. And, and I think they were absolutely right. And, you know, it's that insight that, you know, that I'm trying to build on. Well, from your lips to society's ears, uh, I think so. I mean, that's certainly the team human approach. And you could be, when we do have 
a governance council, you can come and uh, you could <laughs> help us organize come the and, team. Come human. and uh, consult. Can I? Can I yeah, consult? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We don't get into that into that that particular hands on territory much, but um, I I refer all um, to you and your work and your and your program and your book. Um, for uh, uh, ways of ways of doing um, 21st century digital media environment uh, organizing and civics in ways that don't just impose some Bitcoinification or uh, feudal uh, feudal uh, digital empire and uh, entertainment and sports us. and games. Don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I was saying entertainment. I kind of meant the reality TV entertainment of digital that that people don't look at their computers as ways to type and participate anymore, but just a way to look at yeah. videos. You yeah, know, the it's consumption like, uh, politics. Yeah, yeah, right. That it kind of it's the television environment more than the digital one. If we got to really embrace the possibilities of this again, um, but we, hopefully we will. There's still time, right? There's time. There's time. <laughs> I think there's some time, but it's, it's, you know, I think it's ticky. I mean, the world is, you know, there, it depends who there's time for. I mean, like the earth will be around for, for a while. The question is whether it'll let us stay on it, you know? <laughs> and, right. And, uh, you know, that, that's where the talk, clock is ticking and it's our, you know, it's up to our ability to like figure out how to do some basic things that we can't seem to figure out how to do right now. And, yeah. you know, that's another, you know, crucial thing for me. And this is, is like, you know, we we're really failing at making some basic decisions that we need to make to survive. Well, it's time to start making them, whether it's Lum Lumio or Polis <laughs> or the next uh, the next great platform. Um, I'll be there. I'll sign the user agreement. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, it it won't be a tool, but it's a... <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I, I, I do. I do. Uh, you know, I fall for the, the solutionism. I fall for the hope that, you know, I, I love a new app, you know, I, you know, I, I fall for, for the dream um, that all we need is just, you know, that, uh, uh, that thing to come in and fix this. But all right, they figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, but I thankfully know. I'm I'm part of a department full of full of smart people who uh constantly remind me of the you know the the cardinal sin of media studies which is technical technological determinism. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is our sin. I know it's an easy way to see things sometimes. But I know but we're not, it's not the Team Human way. It's, it's not, not the, the Team, team human, human way. No. no. Well, thank you, though. Thank you for being on Team thank Human. You, thank you for your work. Good luck with this, uh, with this book and your, your, continuing, uh, uh, your continuing efforts to uh, bring some, some sanity, clarity, and goodness to our, uh, to our civic and, and technological worlds. Yeah, what you said. Thank you for yours. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody, get this book or steal it, which is fine. No, um, it's, it's free. It's free. It's free. It's free. It's free. Open access. You can download it on as well. After download February it 27, and pretend 20, you're stealing 24. it. If you get that, if it That's gives right. you a little thrill, it's fine. Yeah, no, I'm spaces. sure you can get it off of an illegal site, even though you can also download it off of <laughs> UC right. Press. Um, and they have these beautiful editions uh, online. Yeah, it's it's great. But I mean, yeah, if, sure if it feels out, better to you, yeah. you could totally steal yeah. it. <laughs> Excellent. Whatever works. All right. I know if you're in the Avi Hoffman thing, if you got to steal it, just go somewhere and steal it. But you could have it for free. It's all good. All right. All right. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you, Doug.